publication on the Schiller in 668. Obviously from this, I'm trying to cover an extremely long period of time. Uh, so I'll just be giving a broad overview and summarizing some of the interesting discoveries. Um, well, I hope you'll find it interesting. Just for some context, obviously I'm sure everyone knows where Korea is, um, but this shows the wider setting. And one thing I do want to say is that at various points I'll be uh, including these areas in my discussion, uh, the Liaodong Peninsula and parts of Manchuria. Um, we'll see uh, that at various points in time, these regions were highly interconnected uh, with what was going on in Korea. Also, just to orient you or remind you, these are some of the major rivers in Korea and the primary provinces or regional areas, which I'll refer to during the talk to, to locate some sites. So I'll start at the beginning uh, in the Paleolithic, which lasts up until around 8000 BCE, but is itself split into early and late phases. The earliest hominid inhabitants were likely Homo erectus, like this guy, um, but we don't have any fossils in Korea um, during this period. And these people mainly seem to have lived in caves, hunted and gathered and used these axes and cleavers um, made of river, river cobbles. Now the late Paleolithic is when we see Homo sapiens with fossils appearing in North and South Korea. Uh, these people oh, from about 40,000 years ago, these people appeared using more sophisticated stone tools finely crafted blades and other flaked tools. Um, they also used ground stone tools, which have often been seen as characteristic of the Neolithic, uh, particularly in Europe. But as you can see in the bottom right, um, Paleolithic people in Korea were crafting such items, uh, probably using them to grind plants and seeds uh, for food. And another more recent discovery uh, using various scientific uh, methods is that these people had developed watercraft and long distance exchange networks by at least 30,000 years ago. Um, we found obsidian from Bektu, uh, Bektu Mountain uh, in the north and Kyushu, Japan uh, in the south. And these examples have been found across the peninsula. The first pottery in Korea appears at around 8000 BCE, signaling the start of the Neolithic. Uh, the period is also called the Julmun period due to these characteristic conical bowls with the cone pattern, pot cone pattern on. Um, we also see, but quite rarely, examples of jewelry made of uh, shell or bone and clay figurines, and also these bone harpoons. Uh, Neolithic people were still primarily hunter-gatherers, um, but did build more permanent homes, uh, living in small villages uh, with no more than 60 people and often just four or five houses in a settlement. Um, that said, settlements are still quite rare. Um, most sites that are found are shell middens or, out, or camps, uh, places for processing and collecting shellfish and other resources, um, hunting and gathering um, plant food. An analysis of ancient, recent analyses of ancient fat residues on pottery, the, the conical jars, confirms that marine resources were heavily exploited by the Neolithic people. It was a, the main part of their uh, subsistence economy. But farming does appear around 3500 BCE, millet is introduced, but there's very little evidence it had much impact on people's lifestyles. There's not a shift to intensive agriculture at this time. It's, it's one of a set of resources people used. So the Bronze Age starts at different periods uh, in different parts of Korea, uh, in the north, around the Abnok River. You can see this change in lifestyles and people beginning to use metal uh, from around 2000 BCE, uh, whereas in the south it's more like 1500. But either way, we now see much more intensive 
farming activity. People adopt rice. They're using new types of pottery with no decoration. Plain pottery uh, is, is another name for the period, the, uh, the Mumun pottery period. And uh, the characteristic lute-shaped bronze dagger. Uh, in this period, people start living in much larger and more permanent communities, building the same, uh, building and rebuilding on the same sites uh, for generations. And from around 800 BCE, we see the Songgungni culture uh, in the southwest in Chungcheong and Jolla and some of uh, Western Gyeongsang. Uh, people in this culture started living in, in small round houses, individual families, and you, but using uh, paddy fields and wet rice agriculture rather than dry, dry fields of, of the other regions. Um, probably because the, the areas were, uh, in Jolla and Chungcheong are, are much more suited to wet rice with their flatter and less mountainous compared to elsewhere. Uh, in the other regions and earlier in time, people lived in these larger rectangular houses um, with extended families all living together in, under one roof. Bronze Age Korea is also well known for dolmens, these monumental stone structures with burials underneath. Um, the distribution of the dolmens mirrors very closely that of uh, the lute shaped bronze daggers, um, but the structures themselves do take various shapes and sizes uh, with uh, different regional styles and ways of building. Uh, some are like a table, some just singular large blocks above a burial and some almost flat to the ground. And a very important Bronze Age site um, giving insight into how people lived uh, at that time is uh, Bangude at uh, Ulsan in Gyeongsang, where petroglyphs have been found depicting various animals, um, human faces, human figures, uh, geometric shapes and hunting scenes. Um, these carvings were made over a very long period of time, possibly even back into the Neolithic. But we can also see pictures of um, whaling, uh, which has a long history in the Ulsan region running up to the modern day. Uh, finally, relevant to the Bronze Age is the debate about where the earliest Korean speakers came from. Um, various scholars accept that Korean and Japanese belong to a language family uh, with Mongol and Tur Turkic and Tunguskic languages with an ancestral homeland somewhere in Inner Mongolia. Um, but the debate is when the first people arrived uh, that spoke this language. Um, did it come with millet around 3500 BCE or with rice between 2000 and 1500? Personally, I see rice as the better candidate since we see this whole, say, whole scale change in, in life, lifestyles and culture when rice is introduced, which you would expect when people were migrating and bringing their language and lifestyle to, to new places. Um, so in the early Iron Age, unsurprisingly, iron technology spreads um, rapidly through the north but was not taken up so much in the South. Um, bronze daggers were still important social symbols as were bronze mirrors uh, and other items, ri ritualistic looking items. Um, but they were, the daggers were now these Korean style slender daggers. We also have evidence of quite a rapid depopulation during this period in, in the South at least. Uh, settlements become much rarer the remaining inhabitants were still capable to of, of making quite elaborate um, bronze items, some depicting farming scenes like this one, where you have people uh, working paddy fields or so or reaping uh, crops. So there was not a complete social collapse, um, which it's still not a particularly well understood period actually. The later Iron Age uh, is also called the three uh, Proto Three Kingdoms period because um, we have some 
ancient Chinese textual evidence that discusses the various societies on the peninsula in a bit more detail than we have previously. Uh, in the academy, uh, the period is often seen to start, often seen to start with the fall of Wiman Joseon, uh, a polity on the Dedong River. Uh, Han China invaded and set up uh, an outpost near modern day Pyongyang, uh, which has been well excavated, um, that provided a contact point between China and the peninsula people. Others have different opinions about the presence of Chinese uh, at this time, um, but either way, we see distinct cultures emerging all over Korea um, with different customs and styles for each. Um, you can also see new ways of, of cooking and eating emerging with steamers and various different types of um, serving vessels. Um, we have large mounded tombs starting to be built and Korea becomes connected to the wider world very noticeably with glass and stone beads which have been sourced to China and coming in through the northern route of the Silk Road from Mongolia and even the sea route from Southeast Asia. There are, there are beads from Southeast Asia in, in Korea at this time. That's still work in progress on how the, the, the actual routes, whether they're coming directly over, over sea or whether they're coming via China, but there is clear evidence that they're coming in. Uh, an important place to discuss is Buyo. Um, up in Manchuria, it was a kingdom founded in the third or second century BCE. Uh, it's the first kingdom in the region to be recognized by the Chinese empires um, as somewhat equal as an ally rather than a tributary. Uh, it plays an important role in legends and myths of the Three Kingdoms period, um, eventually being absorbed by Goguryeo by the, by the fifth century. The Three Kingdoms period itself sees obviously the rise of the major three main kingdoms that I'm sure we all know, Goguryeo, Baekje and Shilla with shifting alliances and conflicts throughout that period. However, we also see other polities um, like Gaia and the, the remnants of Mahan from the previous period. I'll just talk about Gaia as it's the best known and has the, the best evidence currently. Um, archaeological evidence suggests that the period starts from around 300 CE, which doesn't match with Korean textual evidence. Um, the latter, the, the, the records claim Shilla and Baekje were founded as states in the first century BCE, but archaeologically we see no evidence for such uh, urban and wide and, and complex societies in the south until the fourth century, really. And throughout this period, again, we see further regionally distinct cultures um, with elaborate metalwork, uh, new types of pottery, uh, more, um, sorry, more formal military culture and the rising importance of horses, both in terms of uh, social status and for military use. Um, finally, the adoption and spread of Buddhism is also a major trend running throughout the period. So Goguryeo was probably the earliest state, centralized state to form on the peninsula proper or in the northern areas. Uh, around the first century CE is when we can see archaeologically probably a, a complex society like a state, but a, a political community calling themselves, a group calling themselves the Goguryeo are recorded in the first century BCE. Uh, its capital, Jolbon, was near the Abnok River, uh, and they were generally belligerent towards the Chinese outposts, uh, eventually conquering Nangnang in 313. As described by historical texts, uh, Goguryeo were a highly militarized horse riding society with a king and, and five main aristocratic families ruling over peasants and slaves who provided them food. 
Goguryeo King claimed descent from Buyeo, as recorded on the Gwangeto Stele pictured here, uh, which was erected in the fifth century. Um, although that that story appears to have been a, a later adoption during the third or fourth centuries, um, rather than right at the beginning of Goguryeo. The large step tombs built for Goguryeo royalty and elite uh, offer further insight into their lives with elaborate wall murals um, preserved from the fourth and fifth centuries. These pictures often focus on hunting and martial activities, but some of them also depict uh, scenes of dancing and farming, um, marketplaces, um, wrestling like Shirum, looking like Shirum, uh, the, the traditional wrestling and Buddhist iconography by the later phase. Uh, Bekche uh, emerged on the Han River as a state uh, with its first capital what, at what is now Pungnab and Mongchon fortresses, uh, which are located at Gangnam near the Olympic Park in Seoul. Um, Pungnab was bought, bought, built first in the late third or early fourth century but a single king, archaeologically speaking, uh, the evidence suggests a single king does not seem to have taken control until about 100 years later uh, with a more decentralized social structure until, until then, until the later fourth century. Bekje also adopted a version of the Buya origin myth, um, probably sometime in the fourth century when rulers started to build uh, these Goguryeo style step tombs, which are smaller than the examples in Goguryeo. Uh, and they are very, they, they look the same on the outside, but the internal structure is very different. So it's more of a, um, as an emulation or a copy uh, of, of those tombs, those styles. In 475, Goguryeo attacked Bekje. Uh, and take control of the Han River Basin, pushing the court, the Baekje court south into Chungcheong to Ungjin, uh, modern day Gongju. After a period of reconstruction, Baekje became a, a cultural center, uh, famously under King Muryong, who secured Baekje's border with Goguryeo. He supported the expansion of Buddhism and reformed the Baekje bureaucracy. His tomb offers insight into the impact of Buddhism and the skill of Bekje artisans uh, crafting and, uh, and building. And then Muryong's son, King Song, or the Sage King, um, made Buddhism the state religion and in 538 sent a mission to Japan, which helped spread Buddhism to the Japanese imperial court at the time. Um, the same year, the capital was moved to Sabi, uh, in, which is modern day Buyo in Chungcheong, a center of power for the leading arist aristocratic clan and less isolated from the rest of the population. Um, Ungjin was in the mountains as a defensive measure against Goguryeo, and, but uh, later then obviously moved to Sabi uh, when things were a bit uh, more stable. Song, King Song also renamed Baekje as Southern Buyo emphasizing that claimed dynastic heritage and descent from those legendary figures. Um, Shilla uh, purportedly forms at Gyeongju in Gyeongsang, out of one of the polities of the late Iron Age called Saro, uh, most famous for its burial mounds, which I'm, so, I'm sure you've, many of you have seen, um, which were generally built in the fourth and fifth centuries. But Shilla had many other unique features, uh, including a strict caste system, um, possibly aspects of gender equality and human sacrifice, sacrificial rituals. Um, Shilla was also the last kingdom to adopt Buddhism or Chinese style administration and titles. Uh, not until the sixth century did any leader seem to uh, call themselves king. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll tell you, offer some evidence of that. Uh, so the largest of Shilla tombs is uh, Huangnam Dechong, right in the center of the Tumili Park in, in downtown Gyeongju. It's a joint burial, presumably husband and wife, 
the, the southern burial was built first and teeth identified as male were found within it. The northern mound uh, contains the gold crown, the belts and the various ornaments, the, the symbols of, of rulership. Um, it also contained a gold belt inscribed with the phrase, a belt for my lady, implying that the ruler themselves could have been female or that they co-ruled with the man. Indeed, um, some analysis of Schiller royal lineages um, indicates that rulership in the early period passed through the female line or at least passed equally to daughters uh, until the fifth century. Kings were either the sons of the previous king and queen or uh, in, in, the, in the later records, um, sons in the later records, kings were either the sons of the previous king or an unrelated man married to the daughter of the previous king and queen. Uh, so it's thought perhaps later Confucian historians edited out these female rulers to emphasize their husbands. We also see other interesting features of Shilla rulership through to the sixth century, uh, a stone here, the, the Neng, Nengsu Steli, Stile um, proclaiming, which proclaims laws or judgments uh, mention the presence of multiple kings sitting on the same council in the early 6th century. Uh, Shilla legend says that the kingdom was founded by six kings or chiefs, depending on the version, uh, who found a heavenly boy who had hatched from an egg, uh, who was then made king. So it's possible that Shilla was ruled by council during the early period, rather than a despotic leader or king, or singular king. Another interesting feature of Shilla society was its use of human sacrifice. Um, for example, the smaller chambers you might see around the circumference of Huang Nam De Chong contained um, retainers who were likely killed as part of the ceremony and buried with the uh, king, queen, or whoever was buried there. Um, we have Contextual evidence, we only know of this practice through a record that it was banned in 502, but investigations of the tombs themselves reveal, confirm the presence of these retainer burials. Uh, people were also buried under large constructions, presumably to keep buildings safe and strong. Um, and most of these sacrifices seem to have been children or young adults. A well-known Shilla ruler was perhaps uh, Queen Sondok, under whose rule the scene for Shilla domination was set. Uh, she directed Shilla to invest in research and construction projects like the observatory at Chomsongde or the pagoda at uh, Huangyong Temple. That pagoda was destroyed by later Mongol invasions, but it was said at, its, at the time it was said to have been the tallest in East Asia. Crucial, perhaps crucial to the later unification was the alliance she made with Tang China, uh, which will become important in a couple of minutes. The final polity or group of polities I want to talk about is Gaia, located on the western side of the Nakdong River in southern Gyeongsang, with Shila on the eastern side. Uh, these polities don't get much attention in the historical record, um, but they were a collection of apparently independent allied chieftainships or confederacy uh, with leadership shifting over time. For most of the period, they are allied with Baekje and Japan. Uh, Gungguan Gaia or Gold Crown Gaia at Gimhe uh, was the key player in the early period, um, controlling much trade with Japan and being a center of uh, pottery and iron production. The graves of Gaia elites were full of iron ingots and pottery, uh, suggesting that control of production was a key source of power here. However, it's, it's Degaya that left the most obvious evidence of the emergence of kingship within Gaia. And near the end of its, the period, the, the tombs at Jisandong near Goryong in Gyeongsang hold elaborate gold work and unique cultural styles uh, with la within large tombs placed on prominent mountain ridges. 
and Degaya was the only polity to have sent an emissary directly to China, uh, which it did in 479. So the end of the Three Kingdoms period is marked by the unification under Schiller in 668. Uh, throughout the sixth century, uh, Gaia was gradually overtaken by Shilla and Baekje, uh, while the alliance with Tang in the Tang China in the seventh century allowed Shilla to conquer both Baekje and Goguryeo in joint expeditions with Chinese troops. Uh, Tang betrayed that alliance once Goguryeo was conquered, but Shilla was able to push them off the peninsula aided by remaining Goguryeo forces, although that took uh, many years. The, the other shaded area you can see is, um, is Balhe, a, a topic of some controversy, um, but uh, it was a state composed of Malgal, who were Manchurian horse riding people and Goguryeo refugees, um, starting around 698. Now, there are multiple conflicting sources, uh, stories about its founding. Um, some suggest it was founded by a Goguryeo general or a Malgal chieftain. Some suggest it was granted by, uh, by Tang China uh, in, in gratitude for the help of Malgal uh, in suppressing inner Mongolian rebels. Uh, it's, it's not fully understood how, it start, how, how that came about. Uh, sorry, but uh, yes. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I hope that was some some had some informative information for you. Uh, any of these periods could have a talk all to themselves. Um, so I hope that was not too rushed or broad. Um, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions you have. Um, so thank you. <laughs>